Good evening, church. I trust that you are keeping well. Thank you for joining us this evening as we continue our series through 1 Corinthians. We're getting to some really difficult chapters coming up, but I trust that the Spirit of God will help us to understand uh, what God is saying to us through His Spirit, and I trust that this will be helpful for you uh, as we go through these gifts and list them. Um, I'm going to read from Scripture, and I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to read uh, verses 8 through to 10a. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through to 10a. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers. We're going to pause there because I want to pick up in the next uh, time, we're going to slow down a little bit on this. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Our Father, we are so grateful for your word. We thank you for the way in which you continue to speak to us through it. As we wrestle through spiritual gifts, we know that for some of these gifts, there is difficulty in understanding them. But we ask that you would just give us insight to be able to discern what you are saying and help us to understand if any of these gifts are gifts that you've given to us. And if they are, I pray that you would enable us to take them and to use them for your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. In the previous church that I pastored, we had a elderly lady who was an incredible prayer. She would come to our prayer meetings, and whenever she prayed, sometimes I would just want to listen to her prayers because she had such beautiful way of saying her prayers, such a gentle spirit, but such a, a wonderful prayer. And I used to know that she would go home, and she would spend many hours on her knees praying and praying and praying to the Lord. I know that even in this church, I'm aware of people who spend so much time on their knees praying for uh, the church, praying for people in the church. And that is one of the ways in which the spiritual gifts function. There's no question that some people are just particularly gifted in praying. It's not that we shouldn't all pray. Of course we should all pray. But there is some who seem to be more gifted than others in praying. Now, just because Paul doesn't list praying as a gift in this section doesn't make prayer not a gift. And I want you to start this by reminding you that not all the gifts are listed here because I think that the danger is that when we go through this list of gifts that Paul gives in the Corinthian passage, that we get to the end of it and we think, you know, my gift is not lifted, listed there, I, or there's no gift listed there that actually corresponds with me. So do I have any spiritual gift whatsoever? And the answer to that is an emphatic yes. If you are a Christian, you have a spiritual gift. And I want us not to become so caught up in these gifts as we go through them to think that they are the only spiritual gifts that are around. But some of the gifts that the Apostle Paul lists here are gifts that you will immediately recognize, and some of you will be able to say, yes, that's my gift. So I trust that as we go through this, it will be instructive for you, and some of you will come away knowing something of a gift that you have that previously perhaps you were a little bit unsure of. So firstly, I want you to notice the list of all these gifts, and we're going to begin with the spirit of wisdom. Look at verse 8a, the spirit of wisdom. To one, there is given through the spirit the message of wisdom. Now, what I want you to understand is that there is a close correlation 
between wisdom and knowledge. I know that they are given here as two separate gifts, but as you will see as we go through these, there's a very close relationship between the two. And the emphasis that the Apostle Paul places here is not on the gift of wisdom or knowledge, as we will come to, but he places the emphasis on message. It is a message of wisdom that is given to people. Now, exactly what does he mean? Well, what the Apostle Paul does not mean is he's not talking about a practical, everyday, common sense kind of wisdom. Now, some people are blessed with common sense, and some people are not blessed with common sense. That's just the way it is. Some people are wiser than others. This is not that kind of practical wisdom that the Apostle Paul is spoken about. But rather, it is a message that issues from wisdom. Most likely, the Apostle Paul is contrasting the wisdom of the world with the wisdom that comes from God. The Corinthians, when I say Corinthians, I'm talking about now not the church, but the society at Corinth prided themselves on wisdom. But the wisdom that is spoken about here is a newfound wisdom. It is a wisdom that comes from God. It is a wisdom that is unlike the world's wisdom. It is a wisdom that springs from an intimate relationship with God. It is that same wisdom that Paul spoke of early in the letter, the wisdom that shames the wise. It is a wisdom that perhaps is not always recognized by the world. The world sometimes dismisses it and thinks it's not wisdom at all, but it's foolishness in their sight. But it is a wisdom that comes from God, and here it is primarily grounded in the message of that wisdom, which is crucified Christ. It is primarily geared towards that, that, uh, uh, that, that those who are able to proclaim the message of, of the crucified Christ in a clear way, in an easy way, in an understandable way, and who are particularly gifted in being able to bring that message to a lost and dying world. And what must be avoided at all costs here yeah, is these people who think that somehow they have a word of wisdom for everyone. And they stand up and say, God has got a word of wisdom for you and a word of wisdom for you. I want to give you a real example of this. And you may think it's a little bit bizarre, but this actually happened. Now, if you happen to be a pastor filled with young single men and young single women in your church, but you want to pastor a church filled with young married couples, how do you accomplish that? Let me tell you a true story about the method used by one pastor. He preached a sermon on Joshua 6. He described how the Israelites marched around the city of Jericho seven times, and on the seventh time they shouted. The walls had collapsed, and the Lord had given them the city. And like every good pastor, he finished the sermon with this application. He had a word of wisdom for the church regarding that passage. He told his church that God had revealed to him the application of this passage. If any single man desired to marry any of the women in the congregation, they were to stand up, walk right over to the girl, march around her seven times, and shout. If they did that, the Lord would cause the walls of her heart to collapse, and they would be married. Now, guys, you can imagine an offer like that. Pick any single woman in the room you want, march around her, and she's yours. If you have had an eye on a cute blonde who always sits at the front row, but you were too afraid to ask her out in case she said no, well, now's your chance to name her and claim her in the authority of God himself. What a deal. Let's put the shoe on the other foot. Ladies, you know this guy has been ogling you. He sent shivers down your spine. 
Now your worst nightmare has come true. You have heard the sermon. He is now walking towards you. He's marching around you. And you know what's going to happen next. He's going to claim you on the word of God for himself. This is a completely true story. A number of men claimed their prize, shouted for joy, and married those helpless women. And the women married them. Because after all, who can argue with a word of wisdom that comes directly from the Lord? The net result was many of those marriages ended up breaking up. Now that's the danger of this word of wisdom. Now I know a real example of this in a church that, uh, of, uh, of someone in a church that I pastored, no one that any of you know, that had gone to his wife, who he was now married to, before they were married, and said to her, God's told me, that you must marry me. And she did, on that word of wisdom from the Lord. And it resulted in an unhappy marriage. So that's not what this is. And if someone comes up to you and says to you, I've got a word of wisdom for you, the way to respond to that person is to say to them, well, if God hasn't said it to me first, then I don't need to hear it from you. Thank you very much. Because this word of wisdom is bound up with the crucified Christ and the message of the crucified Christ, which is foolishness to the world. Secondly, the message of knowledge. Look at verse 8b, and that is coupled together with this. It is important to note the overlap. What knowledge is not, it is not some inspired knowledge that comes to you, that causes you to invent something. It's not invention knowledge, for example. It's not some inspired knowledge that comes to you that gives you intimate details of another person, as though God is giving you insight into their personal life. Neither is it the kind of knowledge that God is supposed to give you when you haven't studied for an exam, and you wake up the next morning, and you've got to write the test, and you haven't studied properly, and now you're praying and saying, Lord, 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 please give me a word of knowledge. It's not that kind of knowledge either. It means the ability to know what is true. It means the ability to distinguish that which is false. It is an overtly perception to be able to immediately recognize where false knowledge is being propagated. It's a very, very important gift because there are those whom God gives a special ability who recognize false teaching straight off the bat. They don't have to be uh, told that it's false teaching. They know it straight away. And it, it, it speaks about that ability to discern that, to have that knowledge where you recognize it straight up. It is a spiritual knowledge, in other words, and it is closely allied with the previous gift. It is a spiritual knowledge to discern God's truth and to be able to recognize it when it comes. Thirdly, there is the gift of faith. Look at verse 9a, the gift of faith. By means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. Do you notice how Paul keeps emphasizing by the same Spirit? In other words, Paul is reminding us that all of these gifts come by the Spirit of God. They are all dependent upon the Spirit of God, and it is He who gives them. Now he talks about faith. This is not salvation faith. That is a different faith altogether. But this is a faith, rather, that is able to see beyond the natural and see God being able to accomplish great things that are somewhat out of the ordinary. It's those people who are gifted with an extraordinary faith to believe things that to others seem almost impossible. It is to trust God in spite of the circumstances seeming as though what you're trusting for is something that 
is unlikely ever to materialize. It's that faith that just says to the Lord, I know that this is going to occur. I know that this is going to happen. It's the faith that believes God is going to do something out of the ordinary, something extraordinary. And it is a faith, that kind of faith that is given to certain people. Now, I've met people like that who have an extraordinary faith. I've read about people like that who have an extraordinary faith. Let me give you one example of that. This is a story related about George Mueller. This by uh, Mrs. Charles uh, Komen. I went to America, she's relating the story, some years ago with the captain of a steamer who was a very devoted Christian. When off the coast of Newfoundland, he said to me, the last time I crossed you, five weeks ago, something happened which revolutionized the whole of my Christian life. We had George Mueller of Bristol on board. I'd been on the bridge 24 hours and never left it. George Mueller came to me and said, Captain, I've come to tell you that I must be in Quebec Saturday afternoon. It is impossible, I said. Very well. If your ship cannot take me, God will find some other way. I've never broken an engagement for 57 years. Let's go down into the chart room and pray. Now remember, these are sailing boats. They're not powered by engines. I looked at that man of God and I thought to myself, what lunatic asylum does he come from? I've never heard of such a thing as this. Mr. Mueller, I said. Do you know how dense this fog is? No, he replied. My eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance in life. He knelt down and prayed one of the most simple prayers. And when he had finished, I was going to pray, but he put his hand on my shoulder and told me not to pray. First, you do not believe, he will answer. And second, I believe he has. And there's no need for you, whatever, to pray about it. I looked at him and he said, Captain, I've known my Lord for 57 years. And there's never been a single day that I failed to get an audience with the king. Get up, captain, and open the door, and you will find the fog is gone. I got up, and the fog was indeed gone. On Saturday afternoon, George Mueller was in Quebec for his engagement. Now that kind of faith is extraordinary. And let's be honest about it. Not all of us have that kind of faith. That kind of faith is given as a gift to certain people. And there may be some of you watching who have been given that kind of faith that believes God is able to do extraordinary things and has seen those things occur. One of the evidences of the fact that you have the gift is to see the application of that gift. So for George Mueller, who had that orphanage, there is story after story after story where there was no food on the table, where they had nothing to feed those orphans, where George Mueller got down on his knees and at times he gave thanks for food that was not on the table, only after having finished the prayer for the door to be knocked on and there someone standing out with food that they were bringing to the orphanage because they had leftover food from their deliveries of bread or whatever the case may have been. And that happened frequently during his time. Now that kind of faith is unusual, but it is the kind of faith that God gives to certain people. And maybe you are one of them. Fourthly, I want you to notice the gift of healings. The gifts of healings. Gifts, plural. Healings, plural. That's the way it comes out in the original. Let me read it the way it really is framed. By the same Spirit to another gifts of, and it should be healings. It's in the plural in the original. By that one Spirit. Now I want to pause here 
a little bit longer than I've spent on the other gifts because this is one of those gifts that has caused all kinds of trauma in the church over the years and has been misused and abused in many different settings. It's one of the most misunderstood gifts in Scripture. This gift does not mean, we're going to deal with the negatives first, it does not mean that God heals everyone. You see, it's easy for some to say, well now, I have this gift of healing, and because I have this gift of healing, every time I pray for someone who is sick, inevitably that person will be healed. And so this has been propagated in many different circles where people with the gift of healing get up and they pray and then they proclaim that those they're praying for are healed and if those who are prayed for are not healed, then the, they are blamed and they are said, well, the reason you are not healed is not because the person who's prayed for you doesn't have the gift of healing and not because God doesn't always heal, but you're not healed because you don't have the right kind of faith. And it's your fault that you've not healed. So now the burden of responsibility is transferred from the prayer, from the person who supposedly has the gift of healing, and is transferred onto the poor recipient who is supposed to be healed because God always heals, and this is a person with the gift of healing, and now they have the burden, and the fault is theirs because they don't have enough faith in order for them to be healed. That is a travesty of God's word. It's wrong, and it needs to be dismissed out of hand. And no one should buy into that lie because it is a lie. God does not always heal. I'll give you two examples of that in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. Er Erastus stayed in Corinth and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Here is Paul leaving Trophimus, sick in Miletus. Trophimus is not healed. And then you go to Galatians 4 verse 13. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What happened has happened to you to all your joy. I what has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you have, could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given to the mentee. Now, what is Paul talking about? Listen to that last sentence. If you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Paul is talking about an eye disease that he had. And Paul is saying that I had this eye disease and I ministered to you with this eye disease. He te speaks about this thorn in the flesh. It may be that in Corinthians. We don't know when he writes late in chapter 11 uh, to Corinthians. It may, it, uh, it may be that, sorry, in chapter 12. But it certainly is a reference to his eyes here. And he has got this problem. God doesn't heal him. And so for us to simply perpetrate the myth that God always heals is a misunderstanding of Scripture. There are those, as I said in the morning service, who claim from Isaiah 53, by his stripes you are healed, and they say as a result of that, there is healing, and everyone should be healed because by his stripes we are healed. But let me try and explain that text to you. That particular text is speaking primarily in the spiritual realm. It's speaking about the fact that we have been healed spiritually. It doesn't mean that there isn't healing also physically. But what we need to understand is that healing, that overall healing that all of us will experience is not going to be received all now. It is an over-realized eschatology that thinks that everyone must be healed now. There is complete healing in the world to come. 
we will receive a new body, and that new body will never be subject to disease again. We will never get sick again. We will never have to worry about viruses coming around and causing us to get sick. There will be no viruses, and our body will be perfect. However, that is reserved for the end. That is reserved for when Christ comes again, when he appears and when we receive a new body. At the end of the day, if we were always healed in this world, none of us would die. Because at the end of the day, when you do die, you are going to die because your body is going to shut down in one space or another, whether it's your heart that fails you, whether it's a heart attack, whether it's a brain aneurysm, whether it's a stroke, whether it's cancer, at the end of the day, we are all going to perish because our body is going to stop functioning. Now, if there was always healing and you could always be cured and every disease was healed, everyone would live forever in the here and the now. So God does not always heal now. Now, I've seen this abuse firsthand. I remember going to a service where they prayed for healing, and there was a man in a wheelchair. And the person praying for them shouted out as loud as he could in the prayer. And when he had finished, he said, you healed, you healed. Stand up and walk, stand up and walk. And the man remained in that wheelchair. He couldn't stand up. He was still crippled. He couldn't walk. And it looked like it was a grandson that had brought him to that service. And I'll never forget in that back room where they were doing this healing uh, prayers for people who were sick. I'll never forget the look of disillusionment and sadness and tragedy on that man's face and that grandson who wheeled him out that hall in his wheelchair, still crippled as he was when he came in. I don't know what eventually happened to him. I would have loved to have pulled him aside and spoken to him. I didn't feel it was my uh, right to do that. And I remember speaking to that person afterwards about it and them saying to me, well, it's because he never had enough faith. How terrible to say that. So, Having dealt with the negative, what does it mean positively? Well, I want you to understand that he translates gifts, it's plural, healings in the original is plural. Now what the Apostle Paul is saying is that this is not a permanent gift that is given to someone that they have forever and a day, unlike the gift of faith or unlike the gift of wisdom or unlike the gift of knowledge. This is a temporary gift. And it is, that's why it's in the plural. And it is given temporarily to different people over at different times for them to pray for people who are sick who then get healed. In other words, it may be that you as a Christian are going into someone's home or have a loved one, or a friend, or someone else that you are praying for, for healing. And that at that particular moment in time, God so bestows upon you that particular gift of healing, that as you pray for that sick person, in that moment, God heals them. But because God heals them through your prayer and gives you that gift at that particular moment doesn't mean now that you have a permanent gift of healing. It is a temporary gift. It is given sporadically to different people at different times. So there is no such thing as those who claim that they have the gift of healing. It doesn't exists because it's not permanent. And so it means that those who claim to be healers are claiming a lie and they are doing something that is fraudulent and is not consistent with the way it comes out here in Scripture. Uh, and thus, it is a gift that is given from time to time. Let me quote from Don Carson. Now, some of you know him. Uh, he is a New Testament scholar, teaches at the uh, Divinity School, a uh, Trinity Divinity School, 
and is a New Testament professor. He writes, If a Christian has been granted the charisma, that's the Greek word, to heal one particular individual of one particular disease at one time, that Christian should not presume to think that the gift of healing has been bestowed on him or her, prompting the founding of a healing ministry. It's very important that we understand that. It is not a permanent gift given temporarily to those who are praying for sick people. What that should say to you, my dear friends, is that it opens up a whole new realm, doesn't it? It means that when there is someone who is sick, and when you are praying for that person who is sick, and when you are laying hands on them, that God by His Spirit might suddenly descend upon you and in the process of praying, enable that gift of healing to rest upon you so that as you pray, that person you pray for is healed. You never know. That is the way that gift functions. Finally, in this session, look at the gift of miraculous powers. By that one spirit to another, miraculous powers. Literally, it speaks about activities that express themselves in miracles. It covers more than simply supernatural healings, but any supernatural event. In other words, this is God acting in ways that are not natural. This is the supernatural intervention of God into situations that uh, are resolved in a way that isn't simply done by the natural laws of physics. It is miraculous events that occur. You see this coming out in Scripture. I'm going to just read two. Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 to 13, reads as follows. On the day, on the day Yahweh gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to Yahweh in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. That is a miracle. How on earth does God suspend the rotation of the world so that for that moment, nothing is out of sync? It is a miraculous intervention supernaturally by God who is able to suspend the normal workings of creation according to his great power and his great sovereignty. Then we have 1 Kings 18, 38, and there are many others. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water on the trench. Here is an incident where God brings fire, fire down from heaven. It is a supernatural intervention of a God who is not bound by the natural elements of this world and causes fire to come out of nowhere and fall on the altar on Elijah. Then there's Hezekiah who prays for healing and God says, I will add 15 years to your life. And Hezekiah says, how are you going to demonstrate to me that this is a promise is true and that it's going to happen? And God says to him, I'll tell you what, do you want me to make the sun go up the steps or down the steps? And Hezekiah says, well, it's easy for the sun to go down the steps. Make it go up the steps. And God causes the shadow to recede when it should have been coming down. Supernatural intervention. Now there are times where those are gifted with miraculous powers and are able to uh, pray in a way that causes the supernatural intervention of God. Let me give you one story 
on this uh, that is relayed by Billy Graham. 1986, Billy Graham wrote a book about angels. In it, he recounts a most amazing story. John Payton was a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands. One night, the warriors from one of the local tribes surrounded the mission headquarters, planning to burn Payton's, the Paytons out and kill them. When, uh, as you can imagine, John Payton and his wife were terrified and spent all night praying that God would save them. Now, at one level, that doesn't seem very remarkable. Read on. When the daylight came, they were astonished to see the warriors leave without attacking them. A year later, the chief of the tribe became a Christian. During the course of their conversations, John Payton asked the chief about that night. What had kept the warriors from burning down the house and killing them? The chief asked, Who were all those men you had there with you? Peyton replied, There was no other than my wife and I. The chief then told Peyton that he and his warriors had seen hundreds of men standing guard round the mission headquarters, men with shining clothes and holding drawn swords. Did you get it? Miraculous intervention of God. And God gives some people with that ability when they pray for those kinds of supernatural miracles to occur. Miraculous powers. Yes, God still does miracles. And perhaps that is the way in which God will gift you. It is not a gift that it operates all the time, but it operates sporadically from time to time where the situation necessitates it, where the situation requires the intervention. God is able to enable a person to have the supernatural gift of miraculous powers. And perhaps God may gift you with that one day, or you have already seen something supernatural occur as a result of this gift God has given you. And so as we bring this section to a close, I want you to see that all of these gifts ultimately operate for the glory of God and are given by God's Spirit according to God's sovereignty to those whom he chooses to give. And it's not for us to demand those gifts. It's not for us to say, oh, I wish I had the gift of miraculous powers. Why is just God giving me the gift of helps rather than the miraculous powers? It is for us to accept, embrace, and use consistently those gifts God has given us in the service of his people. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. I pray that for those who are watching and listening, that you would enable them to be able to discern whether or not any of these gifts we have looked at tonight have a application to them. And if they do, I pray, O oh God, that by your grace you will enable them to use those gifts for the glory and honor of your name. Amen. God bless you for the remainder of the week.